Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webcast. My name is Christine Dursey Davis. I'm the executive director of the Ohio chapter of the American Planning Association, and I am chair of APA's New Urbanism Division, and I'm your webcast moderator. Today is Friday. I can't believe it. It's November 22nd. Uh, and we're going to be hearing the presentation, Planning for Housing, Using the APA Policy Guide on Housing. This is a really great, timely webcast. Um, for technical help during today's webcast, you can type your questions in the chat box found in the webcast toolbar. And for your content questions related to the presentation, again, just type those in the chat box found in your webcast toolbar. And we'll answer those at the end of the presentation during the Q&A. Coming up is a list of our sponsoring chapters and divisions for 2019. Thanks to all of those participating uh, chapters and divisions for making these webcasts possible and free to members. In particular, today, we're thankful for the Massachusetts chapter of APA for hosting today's session. So thanks to you. Coming up is a list of our remaining webcasts for 2019. We're booking 2020 webcasts. We're gonna have them up on our website soon. Just head over to planning, ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast to register for our last few, um, our very last webcast on December 20th. Uh, we're getting that information in shortly. Uh, so be sure to check back. This is gonna be a, a, an interesting webcast. Uh, today's webcast has been approved for 1.5 CM credits for live viewing only. We do have some recorded webcasts that are available for on-demand distance education through the end of December. And uh, one session is ethics, another one is law, each of which uh, are worth one and a half credits. And you can get more information on that and how to view them and how that works, again, on our webcast webpage, the link there at the bottom of your screen. Uh, to log today's session for CM credit, just head over to planning.org, log into your My APA account, and from there you can either search by today's title or the event number. The event number is listed there in parentheses. And if you didn't get a chance to write them down or you can't find these after the webcast when you're trying to log your credits, again, just head over to our webcast webpage. All the info is listed there. Like us on Facebook, Planning Webcast Series, to receive any up-to-date information or things we need you to know right away. And subscribe to our YouTube channel. Head over to YouTube, search Planning Webcast. We'll pop up along with our over 300 webcasts. We have over 2,000 subscribers, so hit that red button, subscribe to us, and you'll get info when we post our new sessions and uh, if there's any uh, news or uh, other sessions that we're posting outside of the webcast series. We'll have all that info that we'll bing over to you so that you can uh, take a peek and watch our videos. So with that, um, oh, and of course, we are recording today's webcast, and it will be up on our YouTube channel. And we'll also have a PDF of the presentation available at the conclusion of today's session on our webcast webpage. Again, ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. OK, I am done with my housekeeping items. So I am turning it over to today's panelists. Jennifer, did you get the pop-up message? You did. Yes, I did. Thank you. It's all you. Great. Thank you so much. And thanks so much to this, uh, the Ohio chapter for sponsoring this webinar. I'm here with Judy Barrett. And uh, this afternoon, we are going to explore how to plan for housing using the recently adopted APA Housing Policy Guide. Um, my part of the presentation is really going to provide an overview of the guide and why it's important to plan for housing. And uh, we're going to tell you a little bit also about the APA how, sort of policy making process and what that means, um, how policy is used by the American Planning Association. And Judy is going to talk with us about uh, what local governments and other entities can do using the housing policy guide, sort of diving into the different policy positions that are um, in the guide and how to really implement things at the local level. And also kind of talking about the challenges of advocating while also planning for housing and how to deal with some of the issues around public education and really how to bring this issue into the forefront and keep it in the forefront. 
And then we'll close with uh, a little bit about ways to get some support <laughs> when working on this particular topic. We all need a little extra support. Um, not a little bit different than other planning topics. Housing um, can bring out a lot um, of different ideas and uh, feelings and into the public realm. And so we want to make sure to share with all of you how important it is that there are many opportunities for support. And I think then after that, we'll be able to open it up for, for questions. So we'll look forward to hearing from all of you on the call uh, what kinds of things you're going through and how we might be able to talk with you about those um, those issues and how the guide might be useful in helping you to, to plan to address those issues and to advocate for housing. So with that, I'm going to begin. And maybe, maybe not. Yes, I am. <laughs> So APA, the American Planning Association, has a number of different policy tools. And uh, for some of you, you might be familiar with the, the APA has a board of directors. The board has a number of different task forces and committees that, are, that uh, serve to the board and rec make recommendations to the board. And one of them is the Legislative and Policy Committee. I serve on that Legislative and Policy Committee. And as part of my role on that committee, we do a number of things working with the American Planning Association staff um, and, of course, also with the board of directors. The instruments that we use are, are many, actually. There are ones that are listed here on the slide, but they're all uh, with the intention of trying to guide implementation of APA policies locally um, and then also at other levels as well. And they come in the form of, of course, policy guides. That, that seems to be the most obvious one. But there are other instruments and tools that are used by the APA, including policy principles, legislative priorities, and fact sheets um, that include things like uh, principles about, for example, autonomous vehicles that then helps the APA to advocate on behalf of the planning community about those positions to uh, legislators, and other people who can help us to either gain funding, change policies, uh, change procedures, et cetera, at various levels. And it's informed by a group of people on this legislative and policy committee and others, um, including allied partners in the planning field, who help to inform that policy work and also the policy implementation. The guides are really kind of the, the key product that comes out of those uh, that committee and also, of course, the board of directors. They're ratified by APA board of directors, usually at every national planning conference. Um, so for example, at the last uh, APA national planning conference, three policy guides were adopted, uh, one of them being the housing policy guide, and then four guides are actually currently underway. <clears throat> and members sometimes receive information about these guides as they're under development, by a task force of people who are working on them, which includes usually a number of people from the Legislative and Policy Committee, and then often people from chapters or APA divisions, student representatives, and many others who participate in this process who, again, are either from allied organizations, have a particular expertise, um, and there's many opportunities to get engaged. Sometimes, though, many people aren't aware of the policy guide making process and don't actually see a guide until their, their chapter provides it to them prior to a delegate assembly. The delegate assembly is the, is the body that ultimately recommends the guide is adopted by the board of directors, usually at that same national planning conference. The guide is really meant to be the official, official position on issues that are central to building communities of lasting value. And that's really the APA mes message is to make sure but that is what we are indeed doing. They're meant for policymakers, but they're also, of course, there are many messages in our policy guides that are meant for planners to act upon. Um, 30 of them are available. There's a link on this particular slide that shows you where to go in case you're not familiar with it. Um, but many of the guides are meant to speak to planners. The housing policy guide actually merged a number of topical housing guides in 2006. At that time, I happened to be the chair of the Housing and Community Development Division when that guide was adopted and have been engaged uh, pretty actively in APA affairs ever since. Um, and of course, the guide became somewhat dated. And so uh, many of the guides eventually 
will evolve over time and need to be updated to be responsive to current affairs, look ahead in a more meaningful way, sometimes wants to address uh, tandem issues that have an impact on that particular topic. So with housing, perhaps economic development issues become more central. I would say in this past uh, update, I think the, the central topic is, the, the most re uh, related topic rather, is equity. And that came to the forefront quite, um, quite obviously during the planning process, which meant that while we created a guide and a white paper and we totally intended to use that guide, we needed to be a little bit more proactive and responsive even before the policy guide was adopted in this most recent uh, delegate uh, at the National Planning Conference in 2019. So that's why the APA actually uh, put forth Planning Home, which if you're not familiar with Planning Home, it includes four uh, or five principles rather and tools that planners can use to really get ahead of trying to plan for housing and try to advocate, advocate for housing and really try to move the, the issue and keep the topic in the forefront while we were waiting for the guide to be adopted. So there are many reasons to really have this guide, not just to inform the policymaking and of course to help planners with the work that they're doing at, at various levels, but really to address, you know, in the forefront of the issue is really to address the lack of available and affordable housing. Availability and affordability and quality are really the three three primary factors in why we need to address housing. Um, land use planning and zoning are tools that we have among many different tools to address these issues. Sometimes, particularly in the, the very distant past, but also more recently, zoning and land use planning is sometimes used as a tool to not um, plan for housing, actually. It's a way to sometimes prevent or be more restrictive about housing. And that's that's something that I think planners are struggling with throughout the country in various uh, different ways. Planners and this profession, we really do have the right tools and the skills to address these issues. It's just sometimes we're not working in the environment in an environment that is supportive of them, but we still have to have and, and we can pick from the toolbox. We still have to plan for the issue. And there are many ways to do that. So that's the purpose of the guide is to really set APA as an organization that's working in the forefront on these issues to guide its members and chapters and divisions and the leadership writ large in order to address these issues. And to then, of course, provide you with actionable policies that you can really use and get things done. And to also see how it's aligned with other topical guides that we also have available to you. I would say particularly equity, mm -hmm which is, is critical to this, but also transportation and even the hazard mitigation guide that we have available. And then I think the last item is educating and influencing is a, is a key component to talking about housing. It's not just about changing zoning or doing, uh, you know, map making and, and thinking about housing in that way. It's much broader than that. It's much broader than design and zoning. It's really an education um, that has to be consistent and constant. And so the guide does provide some facts and figures in a national format, but it is important to also provide those facts and figures at a regional level and of course at the local level. The guide as an update from the 2006 guide required us to provide an introduction that addressed more of the emerging trends that we saw coming to the forefront and also ones that we wanna plan ahead for. And so that meant taking a look at the current housing supply and housing conditions, looking at issues around affordability, thinking about where housing has been located and what we need to do about that in the future, and then trying really hard to, to think about a way to address housing needs for all, <laughs> not just seniors, not just families, but thinking about the various communities and people who need housing. And so um, aging in community is another policy guide that addresses some of that. And so we did bring that in to this conversation, but also thinking about home ownership, immigrant communities, and also sustainability. So the guide when you're using it comes uh, with a number of policy positions and there are, there are many of them and I'm, I'm going to run through them now, but Judy is going to dive in much deeper. So I'm gonna give you a quick overview of all of them. And then Judy will 
we'll be able to pop into a number of them and explore how you might actually get that done at the local level, some actionable ideas that are working, um, both from her experience and from many, many people who Judy has worked with in her career. So the first position is really, has always been really the most important one for the, in particular, particularly the housing task force that develops this guide. Um, the modernization of state and local laws to ensure that we have housing opportunities <laughs> is really key. And modernization means taking a look at state planning laws and the statutes that underpin zoning in our various states is really critical to how we're able to conduct ourselves as planners and do planning at the local level. And that means potentially modernizing those state planning laws, uh, looking at ways to link comprehensive planning to zoning, which is not the case in every single state, um, as well as allowing for and um, enabling the ability to, to actually do inclusionary zoning. We recognize that inclusionary zoning is currently being challenged um, nationally, and I think um, that said, there are still opportunities to ensure and allow for inclusionary zoning to occur, and to also make sure that there's a state <coughs> agency that can help to oversee and implement local housing policy. There's inconsistencies across the country in terms of how this is done, so the policy guide is intending to lift everybody up to have the same capabilities in order to get the job done, um, and that means not just modernizing state laws, but also thinking about the modernization of local laws to address these issues. And we lifted up a number of best practices that could be um, incorporated into local laws, including things like mixed use zoning, <laughs> uh, multifamily housing, allowing for higher densities, reducing minimum lot sizes, et cetera. And then the last item here is about fair share across regions, making sure that everybody is playing a part in getting the job done to ensure housing opportunities. Um, making sure that housing is available at a range of price points and in various locations. Making sure that housing is in locations that leverage economic opportunity. Um, and then lastly, transformation. That I've noted the points about inclusionary zoning and multifamily mixed use housing. So the, the last two points are enabling design, making sure that uh, people of all abilities can be able to access new housing opportunities, and particularly requiring that for federally subsidized housing, which is not currently a requirement. The last item here is a transformation of the engagement <coughs> process. Many of us know that uh, public engagement when talking about this topic and sometimes many other planning topics can be not only challenging, but doesn't also reach people who actually are people in need of housing. And so thinking about a transformation of that engagement process is really important. Um, combating, combating housing discrimination and dismantling exclusionary zoning speaks to the need to continue to affirmatively further fair housing, which is a really a requirement for any, any entity that is receiving multiple levels of federal funding from the federal government. Uh, not just those who are receiving CDBG and Community Development Program funds from HUD, but many other jurisdiction ha jurisdictions have to affirmatively further fair housing and ensure that they are in compliance with the Fair Housing Act. So uh, that's one component to it. The, the tandem component is breaking down the barriers to allowing housing to happen, and that's in the form of usually exclusionary zoning. Um, Setting flexible housing occupancy standards speaks kind of similarly to housing discrimination where um, there's not uh, consistencies across the national planning landscape when it comes to how we speak about who is a family, who is a household, and then therefore who gets the opportunity to live in housing in our communities. And so the last item is speaking to the need to really reform local plans and codes to ensure that all of these ideas are captured um, that are that were previously mentioned. The second position, policy position in the um, housing policy guide speaks to the need to preserve existing housing to maintain the quality and overall supply of existing affordable housing. And affordable housing in this context is both the naturally occurring affordable housing as well as deed restricted affordable housing. Um, and it's about preserving those units, but also about monitoring, maintaining and modernizing those units as well as creating housing opportunities um, for older adults and homeownership opportunities. 
The third position in the guide addresses the issue of sustainability and resiliency as a framework for thinking about new housing and ensuring that we are, while we're looking at new opportunities for housing, we're also thinking about the impact of that housing on the climate and the environment, not putting it in a location where it is in a flood prone area. And if we are thinking about it in an area like that, ensuring that it is fully sustainable, ensuring that energy efficiency is, is a component of that type of development. And of course, encouraging things like compact development and other adopting other resiliency or sustainability goals as part of a housing typology. That's not necessarily speaking to LEED or any particular type of requirement. We mentioned net zero, we mentioned passive house, but we recognize that there are many different approaches and systems to this. And we think that it's important for planners to be cognizant of all of them and incorporate the ones that make the most sense locally. The fourth position addresses quite comprehensively the need to address and ensure that public and private finance is keeping pace with and can also innovate with the need to be supportive for the increased need for more housing that's available and affordable to many different people. And by that, it means ensuring that we're advocating for, of course, increased resources. We always want more money uh, to come from the federal government, from our state governments, and of course, locally. But also we need to be cognizant of the need for reforms within the private financing market New products are needed in order to be responsive and flexible to both preservation and production goals, and also less traditional formats of housing that we're seeing coming on the market that have gained in popularity, one of them being mixed use development. We also wanna support programs that deal with preservation, which includes uh, the residential uh, program that is called RAD, um, supporting, supporting innovative approaches to home ownership financing and models, as well as ensuring that HUD and other programs are really finding a way to unite and coordinate across their funding sources that lead to logical expenditures related to housing and planning in the future. And so one of the mechanisms that needs uh, some increased coordination is in the consolidated planning process. Supporting innovative governmental assessment and tax policies is another avenue to ensuring that we really kind of keep pace, particularly when it comes to tax credit policies, but also even at the local level where we're dealing with assessors who may have various ways of assessing new affordable housing that can have an impact on future affordable housing development. Um, also thinking about accessory dwelling units, which is mentioned in the first policy position, but is not actually a concept that is supported by financing or subsidy of any way. Um, though it has gained in popularity as a local zoning tool um, and is it has gained even more interest and traction, traction, it actually doesn't come with any sort of bundle of financing or support mm -hmm. <laughs> um, in any way. So thinking about the support that might be available to create those types of units is also very critical. Um, Back to the state level, qualified allocation plans are an important planning process that happens at every state level that directs how funding will be direct, uh, guided for many different types of housing programs that come from the state and can often uh, prescribe locational preferences, um, demographic preferences, and other things that could have an impact locally. And so supporting reforms to that process as well as how that relates to locational preferences is very important for planners to at least be aware of and partic potentially participate in. And then uh, supporting the ongoing creation of housing trust funds, both locally and then also paying attention to the National Affordable Housing Trust Fund, also an important resource for the local level and for local affordable housing development. Um, and cultivating new partnerships and opportunities. There are actually many other um, entities within the field broadly, within communities, within regions that have gotten into the, uh, picked up on the importance of housing as a topic, let's put it that way. Mm. And so that means people in the healthcare world are really thinking quite strongly about affordable housing and housing in general. Um, of course, transportation thinks about this, but also education, the arts, we're seeing many other opportunities to leverage and continue to cultivate <laughs> new partnerships and new opportunities for housing to be created in our communities. 
The fifth and last position deals with the need to address how to support and provide flexibility and services and shelters and, of course, permanently supportive housing for people who are experiencing homelessness, our veterans, immigrants, and formerly incarcerated individuals. And making sure that we provide that full suite of options comes through not just the National Affordable Housing Trust Fund, but also through the continuum of care process, which most communities are touched by in some way, either as a local participating uh, community or as part of a participating jurisdiction, and making sure that we have those new resources, resources available for people who are extremely low income. Taking the guide to action means advocating for the policies and positions in this guide and in your region, but also working with, if you are working and you're, you're on this call right now, taking the information that you hear from this call today in the webinar and bringing it to your chapter, having a conversation with it at your local chapter level would be a critical follow-up point. And also, if you're participating in a division and wanting to communicate what you heard on this webinar and sharing the webinar and having a conversation about it, that is also really a, a great follow-up action. The Housing and Community Development Division, I know, is really supportive, of course, of this particular policy guide, but there are many other ways in which local planners can get involved, and I think the chapters and divisions are just one way. APA National has an APA uh, advocacy network. If you are not part of that network yet, I would encourage you as a result of this <laughs> webinar to definitely join and follow up. There are many calls to action that occur, including I think one just came out today, and ways to get involved in advancing housing. So I encourage you to do that. What we're gonna do now is we're gonna turn to Judy, who's gonna give us a, a deeper dive into how to turn these policy positions into an action plan. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it to Judy and then we'll come back for questions. Thank you so much. So thank you, Jenny, that was a great um, overview. And I, I want to look specifically at a sample of the uh, the policy positions in the new guide and think about the ways in which planners in a variety of contexts, mainly local, but also state, um, as well as even the private sector, could be thinking about how they can contribute to a more positive, constructive, and ultimately successful conversation about housing uh, for everyone. And so uh, I will start out by looking at, there we go, uh, position 1A, and I know that Jenny already <laughs> You know, reviewed all of these at an overview level. I want to kind of poke at them a little bit more. So position one really uh, includes um, a, a specific kind of statement to states. And I would like to kind of start here because we often think about the position that local planners are in, and I think arguably most of my talk is going to be about that. But I think there's a role for planners in state government, uh, planners who are participating uh, in some way in the nonprofit sector, perhaps, who have relationships with state agencies, to think about the ways in which states can be uh, helpful partners in, in advancing a constructive and helpful and equitable conversation about, about housing. So one of the things that we always try to ask when we do zoning work is, uh, are you a home rule state or are you a Dillon's rule state? And I won't give you a whole lecture on Dylan's rule. It's one of my favorite topics, but it is important to know how far you can go uh, under this, the statutory scheme that exists in your community. Um, we happen, to, Jenny and I are both in Massachusetts, and so we're in a home rule state. And, um, and, and it's always interesting here to talk to planners who keep kind of going back to the State Zoning Act, looking to find out, can I do something? When really the whole purpose of using the Zoning Act here is mainly to make sure you have procedural compliance uh, but also don't do things that the act specifically says you can't do. So understanding how far you can go at the local level is probably very important. Um, and states need to think about how in reforming and updating their, their zoning act or zoning enabling act, depending upon what framework you have, um, you know, to be thinking about ways that, uh, that regulatory reform can be, uh, have barriers reduced <clears throat> at the local level to affecting uh, zoning reform at the local level. So, you know, one of the questions, Jenny alluded to this earlier, is is comprehensive plan consistency. And many states do have this. Um, it doesn't necessarily look the same way from state to state. But I think that uh, that question that we all need to be looking at in states that do have some kind of consistency is, is that process effective? Is it inclusive? Um, 
to what extent uh, are the the state plans that uh, that's to which local government plans will eventually be tested for consistency, you know, actually reaching out to include residents who are traditionally and historically uh, excluded from the planning process, because that's a, just a very important voice. If the state planning process is really sort of in in, in the end um, the the usual suspects and the people who are in leadership position then the framework is probably going to reflect that. And so thinking about how at a very broad level states can lead in demonstrating inclusive planning, I think is important to recognize. Um, Jenny also alluded to inclusionary zoning. I'm gonna to touch on this in a couple of different slides. Um, and as she pointed out, there is a challenge now occurring nationally on this. And frankly, many of us have been waiting for this for about 20 years. Uh, it was it was really an accident waiting to happen. But But to look at your state law and think about do you allow inclusionary zoning? Are you requiring communities to provide it or do you prohibit it? And, or is the statute simply silent? Some clarity from states about, about the parameters for inclusionary zoning, I think would be very helpful to local jurisdictions. So planners working at the state level, um, it would be helpful if you think about that in working on reforms and updates to your state zoning act. Um, and also in terms of the technical assistance that's provided to communities that are trying to do their comprehensive planning. What mechanisms are in place to encourage or require an equitable distribution of housing in every region? What is the role of regional planning? This is a particular passion of mine um, because I think sometimes our local planners are working so hard to try to do what they can um, against what is often uh, a very, you know, very resistant kind of pressure at the local level when reality is this, is, this really needs kind of a regional dimension and, and regional issue. And, I know from one state to the next, the regional planning agencies or commissions have varying um, levels of authority, but to be able to use the regional planning process to lead a conversation and to demonstrate what inclusive planning really looks like, to break down kind of the structural barriers that have existed in planning around um, housing needs and housing development would be very helpful. And I think that Certainly when you're thinking about how does the consistency process even evolve, understanding that the regional agencies really have a, a wonderful role that they could play in, um, in organizing that conversation in these sort of micro levels that, that uh, is sometimes I think more difficult when the regional planning agencies are not involved in the state plan development process. Um, do you require your planning boards and commissions to be trained? Um, one of the things I find in my practice, um, and I've worked in state and local and private uh, planning for 32 years, so I've kind of seen this from different vantage points. Um, the boards that are well-trained um, tend to get it right. And they don't necessarily have to be the boards that have been there forever <laughs> um, to get it right, but when the boards are trained to understand <clears throat> their jurisdiction, the jurisdiction of the other boards and commissions or departments that have a role to play in land use regulation, um, and to understand the, the dire need to be fair when you're administering zoning, um, it, the training is really key. And so when you're thinking about updating or modernizing your state planning and zoning laws, if you don't already require some kind of training, think about whether that is something that would make sense. Certainly. Uh, talking to your um, your statewide municipal association, or or even if you have a statewide uh, agency that uh, that tends to handle um, municipal insurance, uh, would probably have something helpful to weigh in on about the value of training boards and commissions to reduce the incidence of litigation. So there's certainly that aspect of it. But I think in the context of housing, uh, the boards do have a very difficult role because they tend to be the ones that have their angry neighbors not only showing up at their public hearings, but also stopping them in the grocery store. Uh, being able to equip our, our, our volunteers to do a very important job in managing the process in a fair way, um, I think would be a valuable contribution to carrying out the housing policy guide, but also just doing good planning. Um, and so those are things that I would suggest everybody needs to think about. Um, who could be your partners in trying to advance <laughs> uh, you know, a better conversation or more constructive conversation at the state level? Well, certainly your APA state chapter um, can be instrumental in that process. 
um, every state that I know of has some kind of a league of cities and towns or a municipal association. Getting them on board is really important because sometimes there's some tension between the, the interests of the planning community and fairness and equity, um, a regional fair share, versus the, the tendency often of communities to, to want to sort of draw the line at the, at, the, at the town boundary or the city boundary. Um, and so getting those folks on board about the importance of, <clears throat> of a fair and modern planning law and understanding uh, how housing is really this integral piece to what makes a healthy community, getting those folks involved in that conversation is very important. Uh, working with your city solicitors and town attorneys, um, every municipality has some legal advice coming from somewhere, um, making sure that those folks are on board with potential changes that might be made uh, in the Zoning Act or in the Planning Act so that when they are contacted by their boards and commissions and city managers or, or town managers, um, they're well equipped to answer questions as, as, as matters of law. So involving them is helpful and certainly sometimes helpful in drafting and making sure you've got somebody to kind of look at what's being written and say, well, how's that actually going to work at the local or county level? The Home Builders Association, I can't underscore this enough, um, whatever you call them in your state, um, the developers and the home builders need to be at the table. Uh, the resistance to zoning reform uh, often comes from those folks precisely because they assume <laughs> or they feel as though the reforms are somehow going to disadvantage them. I, I have found, at least in my work specifically on inclusionary zoning, that involving those folks early in the conversation about what will work um, has a huge impact on whether these these types of tools actually are successful in the in the community. And also, these are the people we're asking to produce the housing. So if we don't involve them in the conversation uh, and kind of assume that they're not going to be happy no matter what, we're sort of setting ourselves up to fail. So it, it, partnerships with the home builders and developers is key. Urban Land Institute and other development and land use organizations certainly have a role as well. They have members who are often not directly involved with APA, um, maybe involved in, in you know, other, uh, other institutes or organizations, but UOI has a particular voice in kind of reaching the, the audience of people who are interested in fair uh, land use, and fair, fair uh, development practices, um, building communities that are great. In that respect, they are very kind of aligned with uh, APA, but I think that sometimes their membership is kind of a different group. So, Involving ULI and other types of organizations that may be active in your state would be helpful in, adv again, advancing a, a conversation about modernizing zoning toward this issue of fairness in housing. Uh, the graduate planning schools in your state um, are, uh, my experience is that graduate planning schools are often looking for intern, I mean, uh, you know, uh, studio opportunities or research projects. Perhaps they can be helpful in in doing some case study work for you, um, but certainly also educating our planners who are coming through the ranks here on why housing is such an integral issue and how to manage the conversation about housing as they go out into the field, uh, I think is an important role as well. And then the advocacy groups that do exist for affordable and fair housing uh, in your state uh, or county or regional level is, is important. Some people have very active advocacy groups, some areas of the country do not, uh, building an advocacy base, if you don't have one, is really key um, because, again, um, there will be many forces kind of pushing against the idea of regulatory reform for housing fairness. So if you don't have a, an active and successful advocacy or organization, uh, you need to be working on building one. But uh, my experience is they kind of are out there and they need to be activated and brought into the conversation. And then certainly using uh, the, the media as well whether it's the traditional, the newspapers or social media, but those various mechanisms that we have to communicate a message really ought to be uh, leveraged and uh, exploited to the maximum possible to get, uh, to reach different audiences. So those are just kind of things that you might wanna think about in trying to carry out the message of that first policy position under policy one. Policy 1B, um, modernizing local zoning and bylaws and ordinances. So APA and its chapters and divisions support modernization to increase housing production while taking local context and conditions into account. It is challenging to confront and ultimately amend or dismantle exclusionary zoning, but planners really have a duty to take the lead uh, in modernizing 
uh, these practices uh, for uh, for the production of housing, for fairness and access to housing, and so forth. So local jurisdictions really need to look at adopting bylaws or ordinances or policies or incentives that facilitate a range of housing types and densities that serve many different types of housing needs. We had an interesting uh, inquiry on a, a state listserv we have in Massachusetts over the last few days from a, a, a colleague planner who was asking people if they knew of any kind of research out there that might address the, the concern of, well, if we build more over 55 housing, it's just going to mean more kids in the school. So maybe we really shouldn't be building anything. Um, and you know, I, there was quite a discussion that went on back and forth to give some suggestions about arguments to give back to people who who might, who might be concerned about children living in over 55 housing. And I couldn't get over how it just took a while to, for no one ever actually jumped in and said, that's housing discrimination. And we need to address that as what it is, um, that, uh, that people need to understand when you're trying to skew housing in a certain, toward a certain market in order to keep another market out, that is something that communities need to understand is a land use practice that runs afoul of the Federal Fair Housing Act. And we need to be, as planners, able to say those things. Modernizing your zoning matters, yes, but first you need a plan. Planners will say these things. Um, you, so a, a good housing plan typically has kind of a needs assessment, an environmental scan, a clear goals. You know, what are you trying to get to? What are the needs in your community and how are you going to address them? And then a, an action plan that actually is manageable. I think that sometimes the housing plans I've seen that, that don't work have such ambitious or broad action strategies in them that they really are not achievable at all. So don't be afraid to take an action, action plan approach that's kind of conservative, but manageable, because if you succeed, you can build on success. Um, if you're considering inclusionary zoning, um, despite what's going on in this lit litigation world, uh, I would reiterate involving developers in the conversation is terribly important. You may need to think about a feasibility study so that you don't write an ordinance or a bylaw that ends up not working <laughs> because it expects too much in a given market area. Um, have you thought about the nexus if someone asks you, well, what is the nexus for this? Why are, what is the valid planning principle uh, that this is, that this particular zoning is intended to reach and, and, you know, is it fair? Um, Will it work in your jurisdiction? Some communities have had a lot of trouble making this work for a variety of reasons. My experience often is that the ordinance kind of was, was doomed because of perhaps some, um, uh, you know, uh, really very difficult requirements that perhaps were imposed that didn't make sense in that market. So I think conversations, again, with the development community are really important. And then ensuring that the unit you actually create will be available on a fair and open basis. Uh, it really needs to be part of administering an inclusionary zoning uh, ordinance. Zoning for multifamily development, I think, takes just tremendous public education. Uh, despite the fact that it's 2019, I still see this all the time. There's tremendous myth busting that needs to be done uh, about who, who's going to live in this housing and, uh, and are they going to bring my property values down? And you know, all these things that people say because they are they're afraid. And so you, you need to be, be arm yourself with the tools um, that do exist uh, in terms of research and case studies to kind of address these things. But ultimately, people need to understand that not providing multifamily housing has a disparate impact on particular populations that are, that are denied equal access to your community. When you're thinking about how to maybe remove barriers to multifamily housing, aside from dealing with it in your use regulations and dimensional regulations, check your parking. Parking requirements are often the thing that I find that is just the death knell of multifamily housing. When I see requirements of, uh, of one vehicle per bedroom, uh, there's a message. And it's, again, it's a subtle, but it's there, fair housing issue that you need to kind of weed out of your zoning. Um, are there areas in the community where lot size or frontage reductions would make sense? Being, being open to that. Um, and then again, the conversation about accessory dwellings. Uh, it, it doesn't serve all the needs in the world, but it certainly is, um, is a, an approach that could be fairly innocuous in single family neighborhoods. Um, the, there's a, you know, ideally you allow them as of right under sort of specific performance standards. Uh, when all else fails or because you're dealing with a very anxious community, you can think about special or conditional use permits. But I think the easier you make that permitting process, 
um, and the more realistic the, uh, the guidelines are, the more likely it is that you'll actually see some of that production. Uh, things that would help, a trained reliable advocacy core, can't underscore this enough, you need friends. Um, a community land trust can be invaluable in preserving affordable housing. A predictable permitting process, which typically means, uh, you know, it's a lot of right if you meet the following requirements, and the requirements need to be clear. Um, the process needs to be clear. What is it that it takes to get to a yes? The more the development community understands that early on, the more likely it is that you won't get plans that really don't make any sense, and developers won't spend money that they then grumble about because they went to a board or commission five times and didn't get uh, their permit. Um, Funding for new housing trusts is very important. Um, new housing trusts at the local level can be absolutely advantageous for, as a, as a bank, as a local funding source for affordable housing. So it's not just about zoning, it's also about those resources, the other resources that municipalities have at their disposal. I will continue to underscore that all of this just takes constant attention to public education and thinking very broadly about what that public means. <clears throat> because what's what's effective in educating one group is not necessarily effective with another. Um, being open to the concept of tax incentives, um, some communities have had luck with this. Uh, being able to sort of offer what amounts to like a TIF for housing development um, can make a, a rental project perhaps um, successful or not. So if you're trying to think about all the ways in which you can advance a housing agenda, don't don't just limit it to regulatory reform. Tax incentives. Uh, land donations by municipalities, these are things that really can make a big difference. Uh, economic development. The uh, APA and its chapters and so forth emphasize the importance of having an adequate supply of housing in economic development strategies. <clears throat> State and local jurisdictions should engage with business leaders to provide public messaging on the importance of housing and housing development to meet the needs of economic growth. Um, I'm an old planner, and I've been saying this for a very long time, but housing is an economic development issue. And um, I, I, I really, it's music to my ears today to hear economic development organizations, chambers of commerce, business councils, people wrestling with, my God, if you actually want to have a successful industry in this region, in this location, you have to be able to house a workforce. And, and so being conscious of the relationship between wages and housing costs if you don't look at those things, um, it is very likely that even the most um, you know elegant economic development plan may um, may fall short of uh, of being able to be successful. Recognizing that economic growth really relies on access to a labor force, also recognizing that housing isn't the only issue. That if you're trying to attract young workers, which is the thing I hear everywhere today, is how do we get the millennials here? Well, simply putting housing at the end of an industrial park doesn't do it. You have to think about the amenities that lure people to want to live in a place. So the ability to, to kind of connect economic development and housing and placemaking is a golden opportunity for planners. Take advantage of it. Um, partners and tools, an economic development plan, your chamber of commerce, major employers um, who have had trouble hiring, um, and they're out there, so talk to them. Young professionals clubs or organizations also are really almost a built-in advocacy group. Certainly the developers, uh, talking to your regional colleges and universities, some kind of education collaborative can be very helpful in kind of un understanding what's going on with <clears throat> occupational and industry trends and how those wage the wages that are paid in those various um, areas will affect the need for different types of housing. And also working with your community colleges and vocational schools as we're working on making sure we have a capable labor force, we need to house them. Um, and then position 1G on multifamily housing. I'm going to kind of work through these a little bit quickly here just because I know we're going to run out of time. Um, eliminating barriers to affordable and multifamily housing um, and exclusionary zoning and so forth. Local jurisdictions should allow multifamily housing, mixed income housing by right, and reduce permitting barriers that create development uncertainty, increase the cost of land, and stimulate opposition. So we know that a community housing plan can make a difference in the ability to launch a successful conversation about um, multifamily housing. Uh, a needs assessment that demonstrates who can't live here um, can be very helpful to you in trying to build a base of support. 
prohibitions against multifamily housing have a disparate impact on low-income minorities and families with children. It is, there's plenty of documentation on this. One need not look very far for it. Uh, actually, the policy guide has some helpful information on that and the sort of facts side at the beginning that Jen, Jenny referred to, uh, albeit those things tend to look at a national scale. But if you just follow the outline in the policy guide of the, um, the background information that led to the guide, and you try to sort of fill those blanks in with information from your locality or region, you'll find that the argument is there. And that the nice thing about the housing policy guide, I think, is it gives you a structure for the kind of data that you should be looking at. Um, excessive requirements and complicated or time-consuming permitting really do discourage multifamily development and just create more barriers to inclusionary housing. The most successful approach to inclusionary housing really hinges on what are your multifamily policies. And so recognizing that is, is very important. There are so many myths here to combat, it's kind of hard to even look at them all, but traffic and density, impact on public schools, this was the issue that came up on our listserv recently, uh, higher taxes, somehow that having multifamily housing is gonna make me pay higher taxes. It's going to take away my open space that happened to belong to somebody else. Um, the impact on town character, I mean, to me, these are design and performance standards, it's standard issues. Um, recognizing design is terribly important to the success of being able to build support for affordable, for affordable and multifamily housing. So, but, so that is important, but then also understanding what's real in the market um, and being able to educate people about that. Um, I've also heard in the conversation about what, um, what's wrong with multifamily housing is it social engineering or it's badly designed and cheap housing. Um, in the Boston area where we happen to be, some of the most expensive housing uh, is condominium developments that are quite dense and um, they are not cheap and they are not badly designed. <clears throat> and most of them do include some affordability because in Massachusetts, it's very hard to build multifamily housing without going through a process that essentially requires developers to provide some affordability despite local resistance. So these are common myths and perceptions and anything you can sort of assemble ahead of time to be prepared to answer those will be very helpful to you, uh, I can almost assure you. Um, and then par more partners and tools, thinking again about how you work, can work with local advocates, housing service organizations. Your economic development director or coordinator can be extremely helpful to you in trying to articulate the need for multifamily housing. If you have a local Fair Housing Commission involving them as well, they're usually very alert to what's going on uh, in the community around um, about housing needs and potential barriers to people uh, to live in your community. Uh, preparing fact sheets to combat common myths, um, those myths that I referred to on the previous slide, there's, there's quite a bit of documentation available to address every one of those, and you might want to think about preparing a few fact sheets that would be particularly relevant to your community. No one's going to do all of those but thinking about the ones that you tend to hear the most and using those as a basis for your public education program. Working with neighborhood associations uh, is key because many neighborhoods um, you know, may feel threatened by having multifamily housing a lot of right. So, so working with those groups early on so that they can, um, if not become real supporters, then at least perhaps to be able to diffuse, diffuse some of their concern. Panel of experts presentations can be very helpful in communities. Sometimes communities feel like, well, we're the only ones who are hearing this. Why isn't some other town doing, or city doing what they're supposed to do? And having a panel of experts come in and address that can be very helpful that people suddenly realize, oh, it isn't just my jurisdiction. It isn't just my community and it isn't just my neighborhood. Um, and again, finally, I would say case studies are an invaluable support as well, especially for documenting some of those myths. So my last, uh, my last piece here is on the consolidated plan, which is a, a real love of mine. And as many of you know, who are uh, recipient, entitlement recipients of HUD um, block grants, many of you this year are updating your consolidated plans. And, um, and also many of you are, um, are looking at um, your analysis of impediments. And you know, Jenny referred earlier, and correctly so, to, uh, to the Affirmatively Furthering Fair Housing Regulation uh, which is still out there, but has been temporarily suspended in terms of its implementation date. Mm -hmm. uh, but that doesn't mean you can't be doing an analysis of impediments. And there are data sets that were created for the affirmatively furthering fair housing process that are available to you um, through the HUD exchange. So 
you know, taking advantage of the data that are available, but also the consolidated plan process. You know, supporting the alignment of your funding cycles among different programs and matching regulatory requirements to simplify developer compliance and expedite reviews and approvals of funding applications. All of these things can make the consolidated plan process so great. I happen to be working on several of these this year, and one of the cities I'm working with just has citizen participation down so well. I feel like they almost don't even need us. They've just been so, so great. And I do think um, to planners who don't work in community development, you might want to just think about how you build better partnerships with the community development side of this business because they really know what it means to be on the ground dealing with neighborhoods and citizens, and they know needs because they have to assemble an extensive needs assessment for their consolidated plans, the heart of which is citizen participation. Um, you have to do a needs assessment, um, understanding how community development block grants or federal home investment partnership, ESG, or HOPWA funding have benefited your community. Tell the story. There are so many successful examples of people, uh, of communities kind of putting out there, this is what we did with CDBG funds uh, in this neighborhood, and or this is how we assisted these families to buy a home in our community for the um, that they never would have been able to buy. What have we done to kind of strengthen our whole community by bringing these resources to bear? Use the consolidated plan process, not only to do your needs assessment, but to tell the story about the things that you've done. Uh, the citizen participation plan always has to be reviewed every time you start the consolidated plan process. Think about um, not just replicating perhaps what you did five years ago, but also kind of new tools of the trade that might be available out there. Um, and the, one of the communities I am working in uh, had a, uh, an interesting uh, event a few weeks ago where um, the city was sort of celebrating things that are made in that city. And so there was a big arts, arts and culture event. And the staff in the community development office did something that I, I've never seen, I've never seen other people do. They took pictures of different things around the city that were made there. And they turned it into line art and made a coloring book. So children coming into this event with their parents had something to do, but also were being educated about the importance of the land, the landmarks in that city that really make the place kind of what it is. And talk about character defining and, and the importance of public education. That coloring book was just magic. And these are the things that we can do to educate people at all levels about what it means to be a community. Um, get the data. You know, the data are so available to us now. I'm old enough to remember when the American Community Survey did not exist. I go way back. Um, we get data every year now, and it's great information. Um, understand what's happening with the mix of housing in your community and how it is changing. Is it changing? Um, have you got an older housing stock? What does that mean as a challenge for, for housing planning? Um, what do housing costs look like in relation to income? Many of the places I work, there is a big disconnect between what's happened with wages and household incomes and the cost of housing. Um, understanding are there particular areas in your community where that might be an exacerbated tension? Who's leaving your community? Who's moving in? Uh, it's always remarkable to me to work on one of these projects and people think, well, my neighborhood hasn't changed at all or my community hasn't changed. But then you look at the data and you realize how many people have actually moved in? How many people have left? Um, that sometimes there's just this constant kind of very, uh, you know, incremental sort of change happening that all of a sudden one day really is a significant change. So helping people understand the ways in which communities do change and that when you don't plan for change, you're probably going to fail. <laughs> so thinking about the ways in which change is actually an advantage to your community, uh, the consolidated plan process can be very helpful in teaching that message understanding trends that are happening in multifamily and affordable housing, trends with rents and housing sale prices. All of these things are just required data sets for the consolidated plan. How can you use this process that's underway to develop information for other aspects of the planning and zoning world that will help to advance the housing policy guide in your community? That's why I'm kind of underscoring the importance of capitalizing on that consolidated plan process. And I would say the states that are doing their consolidated plans this year for the non-entitlement communities, you need to be thinking about the same thing. How do you get a more inclusive citizen participation process beyond the local officials and the communities that are already getting grants? 
how do you involve these folks uh, and make a more inclusive planning process so that you end up with a consolidated plan that really has a lasting benefit for, for everybody. Um, and then also telling the story, how have decreases in federal funding affected your community? That is a really important story to tell because the places I'm working have all had pretty significant drops in federal assistance through these programs um, and are really struggling to meet the needs on the ground. So while you're telling the success story, also make it clear you know, how difficult um, you know, it has been to keep going. There's a housing market assessment that's required for a consolidated plan. Understanding what's being built in your community today, uh, how fast is new stock moving? You know, what does the absorption look like? Who's benefiting from the housing that's being built? What is the nature and extent of the income, income gap, if any, um, for market rate home buyers? And to what extent do zoning and other policies constrain development of new housing supply, which gets back to the other points that I made earlier in my slides. How can the analysis of impediments address local regulatory barriers? Um, we still have that process available and we need to be looking at how do our land use practices uh, unwittingly or wittingly <laughs> uh, contribute to, uh, to barriers for inclusion and equity. Uh, you have many partners in the consolidated plan process. Take advantage of them. Your housing service providers, the disability services community, uh, the homelessness um, continuum of care, the social service organizations and local schools all have terribly important stories to tell that people don't necessarily hear unless the consolidated plan process sheds light on them. Uh, city and town staff, um, talk to your banks, first time home buyers, uh, you know, lenders who specialize in that, or people doing commercial loan products. What's ha what are the barriers to multifamily development in this area? And, you know, to what extent can the lenders perhaps contribute to, uh, you know, products that would help to address that? Uh, a business roundtable can be very important. A, a variety of businesses in a community talking about the difficulties that they have with, with labor force recruitment um, and keeping workers retention. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, educating your city or town council and your planning commission and city staff. And again, using the analysis of impediments. I think that speaks. All right. Well, thank you very much. And we are, we are now ready for any questions. Great. And again, folks, uh, if you have a question, just type it into that chat box and we'll see if we can't get to it. Um, Jennifer. Uh, towards the beginning of your presentation, you had made a statement saying inclusionary zoning is being challenged. <laughs> what do you mean by that? Sure. Um, so actually, I might I might ask you to talk about the case, which is a and I don't have all of the details of this uh, this current case, but uh, this is something that has case. it was right. So there's currently being uh, there's a possibility at the Supreme Court level for a case to be decided that, um, as Judy alluded to, for many years, decades now, planners have not had clear guidance on inclusionary zoning across the country nationally. We don't have clear guidance. Some states do have, um, may speak to inclusionary zoning. <laughs> Other states don't, it's completely silent. Mm -hmm. And yet there are local jurisdictions that are adopting zoning bylaws that have a component that essentially is in the form of inclusionary zoning, where some percentage of whatever is developed, in other words, must be deemed affordable right. or, uh, or in many cases, the way those inclusionary zoning bylaws work, um, they might speak to the need to provide a, a cost offset in lieu of providing those units, mm -hmm. or they might require that instead of building those units in one location, they are built off site. And so th that requirement, those types of requirements are being challenged by a case that came out of California. And do you want to speak to that? Yeah, I, I don't have um, I don't have many more details on that either. But I, I will say this is not actually the first time that we had a case that almost came up beyond the states to the federal courts. And the, the issue, as I understand it, is this fundamental question that, frankly, it has been out there for a long time. Is, is the production of market rate housing? responsible for or causative of the lack of affordable housing. And so if you say, yes, it is, then you would make an argument that, that there's a rational nexus to, to requiring market rate development to provide some 
community benefit um, and affordable housing. Nolan Dolan. Yes. And then um, and then if you say, well, it's it's not you know, it, it isn't responsible for it. There's other things that are causing the need for affordable housing. Uh, the loss of federal subsidies, the, um, you know, the, the the unreasonable permitting times of communities, unreasonable land use practices, et cetera. If you make the argument that those are the things causing the, the lack of affordable housing or the need for it, then the answer might be, well, is really private development responsible for this at all? And, you know, I think that we've all been waiting for this. Um, and will that case actually make the Supreme Court? I don't know. Um, I, I watch these things, but I, I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know what's going to happen. But I'll tell you that even if this case doesn't make it, some case is going to. This is not going to go away. That there is plenty of interest, motivated interest on the part of the development community to challenge this assumption that they are somehow responsible for fixing what they would argue is a social problem. So that's really, I think, the the contours of the debate. And, and that case, by the way, uh, the one that we're talking about from California, there was an original case, Nolan versus Dolan. This case that we're mentioning is called Dartmund Chirk versus Marin County. Mm -hmm. And that is the case County, that, right. that may be heard by the Supreme Court. It is actually on the Supreme Court website. Right. And you can read the various um, Thank you. components of the case, as well as uh, submit submissions from various uh, institutions about their thinking around the case, which includes mm -hmm. sort of questioning um, the legality of inclusionary zoning, but also the effectiveness of this, which right. I think is right. what what uh, what Judy is also saying is that what could come out of this is some assistance in thinking about and maybe providing some shape to inclusionary zoning that could make it even more impact, have more of an impact and then also be more effective. So it, it could be a positive outcome, not necessarily a negative one. All that said, you are allowed to plan for and include affordability into future zoning and future projects that you might be considering in your community. There's no barrier to doing that at this time. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question. Instead of incentives for more density or inclusionary zoning provisions, uh, have either of you heard of a community setting minimum rather than maximum densities for planned development, and has it been successful? Can developers buy down their density to build low-density development? This could potentially be a source of revenue for affordable housing. Buy down the affordability. Hmm. I have not. Um, no, I have not heard of that particular instance. It sounds similar to potential, potentially a transfer of development rights, mm -hmm. um, where you would be transferring and offsetting that allowable density to another location. That um, that sounds similar to what this uh, individual is Might be. is is asking about. Mm -hmm. um, it also sounds a little bit back, like back to inclusionary zoning, where mm -hmm. you're essentially saying you don't need to build at this density or to include this level of affordability on at this location, but we will accept payment in lieu of right. that housing, which mm -hmm. could be utilized for future affordable housing in some other location or, mm -hmm. um, and sometimes it's not actual development and construction of housing or towards a program that provides an offset um, or assistance to people who are seeking affordable housing. Right. So um, I think that, that that would be my only knowledge of how that would potentially work. I haven't heard about down zoning essentially for the sake of then allowing for uh, payments towards affordable housing. Otherwise, I haven't either. Thank you. Uh, can you ladies talk a bit about how to balance preservation of existing affordable housing in uh, entering neighborhoods with market demand for higher density redevelopment, which would obviously increase the supply of housing. It seems the more affordable the housing stock is, the more potential there is for redevelopment. The more value, the more value for I think creating, creating communities where you're basically doing both um, 
talking about that balance is a local conversation of how much how much you need to preserve and how much you need to grow is is very much coming from a local entity, uh, potentially a body that does planning, mm -hmm. yeah. but could also come from uh, Judy spoke a lot about speaking with the real estate community, speaking yeah. with many different partners about what is the, how to strike that balance essentially, um, and understand what what balance is needed comes from a housing planning process and understanding the market and understanding the needs. I think um, just one kind of offshoot from this answer is thinking about any development without displacement is very key. We didn't yeah. dive into that at yeah. all in this webinar, mm -hmm. but um, it is touched upon in the housing policy guide is the importance of development without displacement. And then also the adoption of local policies, which are not zoning based, but could be, you know, sort of regulatory and in an ordinance policies to protect people who are who are living in the community from that type of displacement, but also to give them an opportunity to remain in their community if development does occur. Um, and, and that can be through local preference and, and, other, mm -hmm. and other possible avenues. Um, but I think this question is about what is the right balance. And I think that goes back to uh, Judy's presentation, which included thinking about uh, your housing needs and having a really strong assessment of what what the community might look like can only help to think about the future development opportunities as well as preservation of existing housing. I also think too that when you have um, sort of inner core communities that have traditionally housed a disproportionate share of a region's lower income people who are those communities are have they been found? We, we have one in the Boston area. I worked on, I think, what was probably one of the hardest housing plans I've ever done a couple of years ago, um, where the whole conversation there was not about, um, you know, how do we get developers to do as much as we want, but it was really about how do we keep people in this city who have, who stayed here and didn't leave and now are being forced out. And that kind of, that turn in the market was really an ideal opportunity to talk about inclusionary zoning because the, if the development is going to happen and it's going to happen because of market forces, then then that is really when you need to make sure that it's also creating affordability to rehouse people who may be essentially you know gentrified out of their own neighborhoods. So that turn in the market is really an opportunity to talk about how do we get affordability out of this market wave, which is a very good thing in these communities. They've had tough tax base, they've had um, a lot of social needs, and um, that were, they were there disproportionately, again, because other communities weren't meeting their fair share. So, you know, I, I don't think the issue is that somehow you don't want to encourage that healthy market rate in investment in those communities, but how do you get that market development to protect the people who are there? And I think that some conversation about inclusion, incentives for inclusion, that's a really ripe opportunity to do that. Thank you. Let's shift a little and have a conversation more about the APA policy guide specifically. Um, and this question is, we, we always talk about both ends of the housing spectrum, low and high. What about the missing middle? What does the APA policy say specifically about missing middle housing and how locality states and APA can address this key issue? And as uh, a side note, we actually had a webcast about this specifically as it relates to, I believe it was a Senate bill in Oregon. We had a webcast that talked about this missing middle housing um, just a few weeks ago. So uh, could you could you speak to that? And uh, does the APA policy guide discuss it? That's a great question. And I think, um... I think planners are right to be very concerned about the middle class and about um, what I think we're all aware of as becoming a shrinking middle class. Um, right. And that, that, that those individuals who are either homeowners or renters are uh, somehow getting squeezed in the market. And part of that is driven by the fact that the market does what the market does and usually at a higher end um, because in part driven by zoning and land use mm -hmm. <laughs> regulations right, right. and the subsidies that are available that have shrunk over many yep. decades now 
are driven towards extremely low income housing right. um, or or the, the you know lower income households pr predominantly because and, they have such a need because there's a very yeah. high need and because there's a shrinking piece of the pie that's right. given to them right. uh, in the right. form of direct and indirect subsidies right and um, we don't have good programs that touch upon the shrinking group in the middle. And it, it is really important to think about that. The policy guide doesn't specifically speak to that, which is really the answer to the question. Um, the policy guide speaks to the need to create many types of housing for many different types of people at all different income levels. And I think that that's still an important message for all planners to realize that you, you we do need to do all of those things. When we're walking the walk, it's about all different types of housing for all different income levels. It's a housing that people can afford. The solutions that go for the, the issues of the missing middle have to do with barriers to land uh, availability, construction costs, zoning barriers, um, and then of course products that are available right. on the financial market to serve those populations. So in many ways, the part that relates back to planners is, is kind of back to the other policies that are the position statements that are in this policy guide that service any different type of housing and any different type of income, and they relate to zoning. So I had mentioned earlier too that one of the things I like about this policy guide is that although the information in it is mainly national, it gives you a framework for if you took the topics that are in here as the sort of factual basis for the guide and did and just plugged in the research, the answers to the items that, uh, but but for your jurisdiction or your region. I think you're going to find the answer to the middle income question because it, it is alluded to in here. It's not the whole focus of this guide, but I was doing a quick search for it while we're sitting here and it's there. Um, so if you're trying to advance an argument about the missing middle, which is an important conversation in housing, I think this guide actually does give you a framework for doing that. It's not the focus of it, but it's there. And just, just one other point to add, we in the preservation section in policy two, yeah speaks to the the sort of concept of like sort of affordable housing the, the there's sort of the big a and the small a for those right. of you in the, who have heard this before the big a being really more deed restricted housing it actually has a deed restriction it is affordable to a specific income level in either perpetuity or for some period of time mm -hmm. and it cannot exceed certain rent or uh, uh, sales price levels and it, the income is set at a specific level mm -hmm. uh, or threshold um, that's that's a deed restricted unit but there's lots of housing that is affordable to and usually it's the the missing middle piece the middle income household right. that is sort of the naturally occurring affordable housing and so the policy position too actually speaks to ways to understand and better assess what's going on in your community around that type of housing mm -hmm. before you can decide what to do about it right of course you need to understand what exactly, what kind of housing you currently have for that population, whether or not there's any kind of uh, deed restriction on it or, um, what, you know, sort of what, what that, what it actually looks like and who it's actually affordable to. Thank you. In terms of the development of the housing policy guide, who was involved in, in developing it? Who was consulted? Sure. The uh, the housing policy guide, all of those policy guides that are created by APA, they are created by a task force of people. I think the authors are actually noted on the APA website. I'm not going to list all of them. Um, myself, as a member of the Legislative and Policy Committee, I worked with a co-chair, Angela Brooks, um, uh, as part of the, the policy guide creation process. And uh, it was informed by the membership as part of multiple surveys that went to out th that were distributed through chapters. Um, we also had a, a number of sessions at legislative conference that occurs annually, as well as at the APA National Planning Conference, um, sessions for members to participate and provide feedback. Um, and then in terms of dealing with allied partners, mm -hmm. the APA National has many allied organizations right. that it works with and shares the policy guides when they're in formation. So in our case, that included ULI, yep, AARP, sure. right. um, and representatives from, from other national organizational organizations to review the guide, provide any feedback while it was being created. 
It's a great question. By the way, anybody can get involved in the policy guide making process. Yeah. And as I mentioned in the beginning of my presentation, there are four guides underway. If you're interested in learning more about how to get involved in any of those guides, um, please feel free to email me or contact me and I can put you in touch with the, the chair or co-chair of that guide. Well, that was my next question. So now I don't have to ask that one. So <laughs> yes, I, I hope is, this inspires people to get involved yeah. in this process. It's a it's a great process to be part of. It also helps you to see the behind the scenes of APA and how things are done and and why APA sends you all those emails about things to advocate mm -hmm. for. <laughs> it's true. Mm -hmm. Comes from the policy setting process. Thank you. Um, next question. Is there a risk of reducing parking requirements for multifamily housing in neighborhoods where a project would be unable to support the additional parking demand as a result? So how to balance parking needs with the requirements that would dissuade a necessary project? Well, I don't think I'd go as far as to say just eliminate parking requirements for residential. I mean, even in in mixed use zoning, typically, you know, there's always this sort of intention to make sure that the residential use has has parking access. But I think you, you know, you need to look at what is the supply. Um, this comes up a lot in, in my work, and it probably I'm sure comes up in Jenny's as well, that people assume there's not an adequate supply of parking, and there may not be. So I don't want to just be too, uh, you know, to be silly about this, but but often the problem is really around the management of the parking supply. So um, I think that before one assumes that there simply is not a way to accommodate the, the parking needs of the housing, it might be worth it to look at what your community's existing parking policies are and is there enforcement of the existing policies that, that you have before you assume that perhaps the, there should not be any sort of reduction in the requirements for multifamily housing. Um, you know, some of this too depends on what kind of community you are. I mean, if you're a community that has access to transit and it's locations where there's transit access, I think the whole conversation is very different from if you're in a suburban location and people kind of do need to get a car to get around. I, I don't, I don't think there's anything wrong with requiring parking, but I think the practice has been to require excessive parking. And I also am concerned when I see the parking requirements tied to number of bedrooms. Because that's not really about anything other than trying to discourage families from living there. And just to pick up on that point, um, when you see that a sing single family uses or two family uses don't require don't have a parking requirement, right, but actually are uses that include many bedrooms, perhaps right. four bedrooms even, maybe even five. Right. Um, and then you see that multifamily housing is disproportionately impact has a disproportionate imp impact when it comes to parking regulations, whereby, you know, they're saying uh, one bedroom unit must provide one and a half parking spaces <laughs> and, and so on, keep going up the ladder. Um, that that clearly is, a, is, is very unequal and, right. and doesn't make sense. I guess the other point I would say is that um, it's not about taking something away. Mm. Um, when we talk about parking, it always sounds like we're taking something away from somebody or something but it's also uh, looking at sort of maybe more like a trans transportation demand management plan right, right. where you're providing many options for people. And, and this kind of relates to Judy's point about location. That's important. Mm -hmm. But there are other ways to invest in uh, possibilities and alternatives other than requiring many cars. <laughs> well, requiring cars, but yeah. also taking away from what ultimately you're trying to provide for people, which is housing. Mm -hmm. And if you're if the focus is on people, then you should provide use that that land use in the best way possible. And that means maximizing it for housing and not for autos. Right. Thank you. Have you seen any local policies that have linked eliminating blight by demolishing vacant blighted properties with redeveloping affordable housing on these lots? Well, yes, I mean, I think really what I've seen more of is trying to get, trying to understand when properties are on the verge of 
um, becoming abandoned or problem properties for a neighborhood and intervening before that happens. But, but certainly, uh, at least in our state, I know that there's been quite a bit of success in working with the attorney general's office and others in, in essentially getting receivership of those properties and, and trying to either, well, ideally rehabilitate what's there so that you're not just taking down a building and creating that problem uh, as well. But certainly the idea of using um, dis you know, a disinvested property to create affordability, yes, I have certainly seen that. Uh, and I think it takes a variety of forms. It can be rehab renovation. It could be if the property is simply unsafe, yes, taking it down and creating affordable units uh, in its place. I think that's, that is done. And, and state level policies can be one way of getting at it. The other yeah. option would be through a tax title process. Yeah. Um, there are many local jurisdictions that use the tax title process as a means by which the community then can encourage affordable housing in place of whatever was there or as a, as a preservation of the existing property, but to become affordable housing, working in partnership usually with a, a local nonprofit or other um, entity in the community that can actually develop the housing. Yeah, and it's important to understand too, uh, in your in your state laws that govern tax title, whether you have the ability to to use the tax title process to get control over a site and reuse it for what essentially is a community benefit, versus having to sell it for the highest uh, amount that you can. The logic being that you're trying to recoup unpaid taxes, but if you have the flexibility to make a community benefit disposition, then certainly um, the tax title process would work. Okay, uh, last question before we wrap up. Uh, in general, what would be your top three myth busters to get buy-in for affordable housing? Jenny, I'll let you start. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, uh, <laughs> this is a great question and I great question, question to end on, wow. Yeah, it is, it's perfect, it's really perfect. Yeah, that was uh, purposeful. <laughs> yeah. Well, the top myth, myth buster that I have actually is that buildings don't create people. <laughs> it's just it's just physically impossible. Um, and and I, I, <laughs> I tend to use that one as a good icebreaker uh, because it does make most people laugh. Uh, and I know where that, that came is, from. <laughs> that it, is, it is physically, humanly impossible. A uh, building does not pr produce people, but many people associate certain types of housing with the creation of children. Um, and that is of course, biologically impossible. So that of course is the first, first myth buster, but can usually be backed up by actual facts mm -hmm. in your community where you can find out exactly how many families or exactly who is living where in your community and, and determine whether or not there is a significant impact on any, any uh, element of your community, any service, whether it's schools or otherwise. And so I do think that that's an important myth to bust because it often comes up. Um, so that would be my top myth. Well, mine, mine is traffic because <laughs> traffic comes up everywhere on any project I've ever worked on for any of the boards that I serve. Um, and one of the, the, the typical testimony is, well, our street is already unsafe. I can't walk my children to school or I can't walk my dog because, and so now you're going to add this housing and it's going to make it impossible but it's already impossible, people are saying, so I can't walk down the street. And and what people don't understand is that if there's an existing condition that's already a public safety problem, that is not the response, that's not the problem of the project that's in front of you. It's because your municipality has addressed this public safety issue. So, you know, being able to kind of respond to people that conditions that exist need a remedy that is not necessarily the responsibility of this new project or the cause, it's not caused by this new project, Helping people understand why some things are the way they are um, and divorcing that from the conversation about this project can be very helpful and frankly educational for the community about how to become more civically engaged. I think another myth to bust is about design and oh, the quality, God. the mm. quality of housing, where um, many, particularly uh, an affordable housing developer, goes out of their way to really be thoughtful about and create best possible units for the people who are going to be living there and that the design is a process mm -hmm. that people can actually participate in That's right. and That's and true. really inform uh the outcome rather than react to uh you know a draft or a concept or a a prototype 
Um, I think that that's, that's an important myth to bust is that you're going to get what you get um, and you're going to, it's, it's sort of put upon a community when actually a community has a really good, um, when they're in the driver's seat and they actually put themselves there, they can really um, inform great design and great quality and standards that most developers will be more than happy to comply with. Because they want a yes. They want they, they want, want a yes, yes. <laughs> but they also want clarity and they yes. want to be able to work with a local community and its That's boards right. and commissions um, in a way that, that shows them that this is what we're looking for. Right. So it's not ambiguous. So it is straightforward. So I think that that's a, that would be another one for me. Yep. I guess the other one is probably the last and the most important one is we don't want those people there. Yeah. And, and that, that's, that's kind of going back to the the need for planners to really affirmatively further fair housing yep. and make it really clear that you don't stand for and you will not allow that type of communication in your community and to inform your board chairs yep. and to inform the people who you're working with who have control over land use in your community that 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 is a violation of the fair housing of federal fair housing laws and possibly your state fair housing laws by the way the federal government has a Fair Housing Act, of course, but also your state might have additional protections for individuals in your state, and you need to be compliant with those. And it's important that we don't allow that type of communication um, and bust bust it when it happens. I think that's one of the most important duties we have as planners is to is to in, inform that track of conversation that it's inappropriate and it's unlawful and uh, those people will be your neighbors. All right. Did we make it, did we make it to six? I think we're, yeah, I, I think you did well. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, so J Jennifer and Judy, thanks for, thanks for joining us today and um, to uh, the uh, Massachusetts chapter for sponsoring today's webcast and all of those that participated in getting um, the housing policy guide put together, all of the, the volunteers, uh, we thank you because this is obviously very important and we need a policy guide for this. So it's great that we have thank that. You. Uh, so again, thank you. um, th thanks to the two of you. As a reminder, if, if you do have more questions, just feel free to contact our, our panelists. Their contact information is there on the screen. If you want to get involved with these policy guides, reach out to them and, and they'll get you into the right hands. We are recording this webcast, as I mentioned before. We'll have it up on our YouTube channel, just search planning webcast, and we'll have a PDF of this presentation. It is now live up on our webcast webpage, ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. So ladies, thank you. And everyone, Thank you. have a great awesome. weekend. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.